Hi Trips, it's Koala here, welcome back to the Armorcast channel, thank you for stopping by today. So in this video, I want to talk about the newly unveiled Challenger 3, the future main battle tank of the British Army, and kind of give my thoughts on exactly what this tank is, so to speak, how capable it is, what the upgrades are like, and what it means for the future of the British Armed Forces. Now I think it's safe to assume that most of you watching this video do already know this. This is a wee bit late, I'm a bit late on this one, and this isn't really new news anymore, but the British Ministry of Defence officially announced a couple of weeks ago that the tank you're seeing on screen, previously one of various proposals and technology demonstrators, such as the Black Knight and Megatron of course, has been formally selected to enter service under the name Challenger 3 in the late 2020s, replacing the Army's current main battle tank, Challenger 2. This is exciting, but also a little strange. As, as far as I'm aware, this is the first time a piece of kit like a main battle tank from a major world power will be actively replaced by a newcomer in our sort of generation. Of course, the Abrams, the Leopard 2, T90, these are all still going strong. We have talk of the Bradleys being replaced by the Griffin, but nothing set in stone yet. And while new vehicles like the Puma, the Boxer, the Terminator for Russia, of course, as well as the T14, and numerous others have cropped up. Uh, the US Marine Corps announced the retirement of its tank unit last year, for example. But off the top of my head, I can't really think of such an important unit type that's been replaced by this since Challenger 2 replaced Challenger 1. The 4th and 4.5th generation fighter jets have had upgrades and variants beyond counting, but the last to really be phased out of service entirely was the MiG-29, that is until very recent news regarding the F-22 Raptor, kind of sad to hear. Uh, so for the internet tank enthusiast generation, this is something we've only ever really read about and seen in documentaries and the history before our time I guess. Most of us will have grown up during the life cycle of Challenger 2 and not really be able to remember a replacement effort like this. But now it is finally happening, and the only question remaining is, is this thing going to be any good? So I do first want to give a bit of fair warning to you guys, just so that you don't get the wrong impression, but I am far from a subject matter expert here. I try to do the best research I can, but at the end of the day, I'm relying on what sources I can find, looking for those that appear to be the most reliable, and my actual first-hand experience to call upon is extremely limited. I am first and foremost a military enthusiast, and somebody who likes to study and discuss these various machines as a hobby, to come to some conclusions and get a sense of them. And today's video is going to be more along the lines of what I think of the Challenger 3, what I'm seeing when I look at the information that has been published about this vehicle, uh, what are my opinions of it. Now, this is something I have been heavily requested by you guys to talk about, so I'm going to do my best to give my sort of assessment of this new main battle tank, but just keep in mind when you watch this video that this is my own personal takeaway for you to, you know, take how you will and not some sort of objective truth. So with that out of the way, what are the facts? What do we know about Challenger 3 so far? So the new MBT will feature, among other things, a newly designed turret housing the German-made L55A 120mm smoothbore main gun. Yes, the Challenger is finally going smoothbore, which is something we'll talk about at length today. This means single-piece ammunition compatible with all NATO standard 120mm ammo, as well as blast door protection increasing survivability greatly in the event of a tank's being penetrated. Challenger 3 will feature the latest generation thermal optics, both for the gunner and commander, which is very good, sorely needed, as well as engine improvements that reportedly raise its maximum on-road speed to 60 miles per hour though this is called into question, and for very good reason. There's also new armour being developed for the vehicle, how much of an upgrade and protection this is we don't yet have any information on, and one of the most impressive aspects of this new tank, which is its new Battlefield Management Battlefield Awareness System, or C4I system, something fully digitised that will allow the tank to very easily command battlefield assets, share information between them, etc. This is a feature that is frequently overlooked by enthusiasts who love to talk about firepower and armour and mobility even, but a good computing system and 
Challenger 3s is slated to be the best in the world, even better than Japan Type 10, which at the moment leads the world on that front, will make the Challenger 3 and its battle groups and supporting assets a fiercely effective force with coordination and boss multiplication abilities unlike anything seen before. The Challenger 3 is being touted as the most lethal tank in Europe, with a new fire control system, programmable smart ammunition, and plenty of other design features such as an active protection system which is still to be decided upon, though reportedly by the time it first reaches combat units in 2027, Challenger 3 will have the best hard kill active protection system possible. At the present time, 148 tanks are on order from RBSL, which is a consortium of German Rheinmetall and British BAE, expected to see full combat readiness by 2030 and serve at least into the 2040s, alongside Ajax and Boxer fighting vehicles, attack helicopters and of course infantrymen, forming what the military describes as a modern armoured nucleus. So, all that sounds very impressive, but there are certain factors that concern me personally, and this tank definitely has its potential flaws and drawbacks that the new design doesn't quite fix. First off, let's talk about what is really the main purpose of this upgrade, the gun. The Brits have finally been convinced to go smoothbore for this tank, and the L55A1, the best NATO tank gun out there today. It's the same length as Challenger 2's old L30 rifle, but this will vastly increase the tank's anti-armour capabilities. Now, it's a common misconception that Challenger and Challenger 2 retained the use of a rifled gun for accuracy, and this just is not the case. In fact, that gyroscopic stabilising effect from rifling that applies to a conical shaped bullet or tank round will actually negatively impact the accuracy of a sable round, that's just how the physics works. I uh, wouldn't go too detailed into it here as I do want to make a video specifically about this. Now this is why spinning rings are applied to the sable rounds fired by the challengers as well as the old sable rounds fired out of the old Legacy L7 105mm gun and its counterparts specifically so that only the sable itself rotates with the rifling and the dart, the penetrating rod itself, doesn't because this would destroy its accuracy, not improve it. So the assumption that rifling equals better accuracy just isn't the case for these tanks and now I know Challenger has the longest kill on record but there are a wide range of factors as to why that was able to occur and the rifle barrel is obviously nothing to do with this because the penetrator itself doesn't they get any spin from a rifled gun? Sable rounds fired from rifled guns are also far more limited in the armour penetration capacity they can achieve, and rifles wear out a lot faster and are more difficult to maintain than a smoothbore equivalent. So why did Britain continue to use rifled guns for so long? Well, it comes down to the Challenger's focus on the infantry support role rather than tank versus tank warfare, and for this purpose, the British Army loves the 120mm Hesh round. It is incredibly powerful, very capable of demolishing buildings and fortified enemy positions, and using Hesh requires the use of a rifled gun. Now, given that the main role of this tank, the one it'll be used most often in, is infantry support and not fighting other enemy tanks, at least nothing more advanced than a T-55, the fact that a smooth bore would be better at the anti-armour role just isn't worth the trade-off of losing that all-important Hesh round, which the British Army's tank doctrine is kind of built around. In recent years though, we've seen huge advancements in smart ammunition types, and this will allow the Challenger 3 to make the switch to the powerful L55A1 smoothbore 120mm without sacrificing that high explosive punch, as it will be able to use smart ammunition types and programmable high explosive rounds that match up to the performance of its old Hesh, while also now being able to fire far better armour piercing rounds and bringing with it all the other benefits of smooth bore, not least of which being compatibility with other NATO tank ammunition. Now, given the new tank is being produced by RBSL, the R standing for Rheinmetall, it's highly likely that Britain will not in fact be developing much, if any, ammunition for Challenger 3 domestically, but rather using German-made rounds such as the DM63, which it was using in promotional content, and DM11, We'll have to see what else. What will be a factor though is that the switching from the three-piece ammunition used by Challenger 2 to single-piece ammunition will require a more significant retraining of the British troops, 
And of course, Challenger 3s will feature blast door protection for the ammunition, a big improvement on Challenger 2's ammo storage, but once again, something else that does create some extra minor complications. Now, these are all things that will be dealt with in due course, but it may mean that when the first battlefield units are arriving in 2027 to 2030, they may not see quite the combat effectiveness that Challenger 2 crews are famous for. So that's the gun out of the way. Now, how about that speed? Now, the promotional material for Challenger 3 has, in multiple different sources, listed a top speed of 60 miles per hour, or around 96 kilometers. Given that this is more than 50% faster than Challenger 2, which is about the same weight and has the same horsepower output, many people have called this a simple typo. But I'm not so sure that seems like the kind of mistake that would have been caught by the various sources that have continued to quote it. Now, the power pack of Challenger 3 has undergone several improvements, mostly to reliability, thank God, because the CV-12 Condor engine is a piece of trash that should have been replaced before Challenger 2 was even born, and the suspension has also undergone some improvements as well, so this tank should handle off-road terrain exceptionally well. That was something Challengers have always been renowned for. The problem is that this is still the same engine, still producing that same 1200 horsepower, which is quite subpar. The plans were to increase the power output to 1600 horsepower, but it seems as though those plans have, for the moment, been set aside. So how could the tank possibly reach almost 100 kilometers per hour, about 15 faster than the previous world record, which is held by much lighter tanks like the Type 10? Given that Challenger 2's top speed is only rated at 60 kilometers per hour, Surely this is just a typo, no? Well, possibly. But what may also be the case is that this is a theoretical maximum safe speed for the engine itself. Now, Challenger 2s have been known to exceed that 60 kph listed top speed, even reaching as high as 70 in certain cases. But this isn't safe for the engine or transmission. It very quickly causes damage to it. And it's possible that what's meant by the 60 mile per hour speed quoted, assuming that is correct, is that the safe speed of the engine has been raised to accommodate anything up to that speed without damage. And what Challenger 3 is going to be able to achieve is something closer to 50. It'll just be able to do that now without causing damage to its power pack like its predecessors did. Either that, or this is referring to the speed that it's capable of when you drop it off a cliff. That brings us to what is, in my opinion, the most major problem with this tank, and that is its weight, 66 tons base. And of course, this is still pretty much the same old Challenger 2 hull, so the theater entry standard armor package, including blocks of Dorchester, composite armor, as well as ERA, will most likely be applied, so we're looking at some 70 tons combat loaded. So even when Challenger 2 gives way to Challenger 3, Britain will still have the most morbidly obese tanks on the battlefield. And that is a bad thing. Let's forget speed for the moment. You've also got to think about transporting and deploying these tanks, traversing bridges, that's a big issue for tanks of this weight, and in fact, main battle tanks in general. Uh, armored recovery, of course, a heavier tank is much more difficult to tow. And just all round, a heavier tank is much, much worse, logistically speaking, than a lighter one. Now, you can't say it's due to armor protection, that's another common misconception about Challenger 2, but this tank never had all that great armor. Both the M1A2 of 1992 and the Leopard 2A5 of 1995 have had better protection than Challenger 2 against kinetic energy projectiles all along. And the Leopard beats it against chemical energy munitions like RPGs and ATGMs as well. While Challenger 3 is stated to have some improvements to its armor, it's highly unlikely that this armor will match up to something like an M1A2C or a Leopard 2A7, given what is known about this type of armor. It just isn't possible. So we're talking about an extremely heavy tank, which is therefore much less versatile without a huge amount of armor to actually justify that. And this is something I can't help but feel would have been worth focusing on fixing with this revision to the tank. Probably more so than the gun, maintaining the rifled gun and hesh round and redesigning the tank to reduce its weight down to the 50 ton range may have made for a better MBT to support the likes of Ajax and Boxer. Now at current standing, the Challenger 3 has no active protection system at all, no laser warning receiver, no radio or electro-optical jamming technology, 
all of which have been present on previous upgrade proposals and technology demonstrators like the Black Knight. And this is definitely a worry. Even now, active defence systems are becoming standard on tanks like the Markovar 4 and the M1A2C with their trophy system. The T90 and Type 99 of course use soft kill active protection systems like Stora. The Armata series, the Afghanit hard kill system. Germany have developed their own APS for the Leopard 2A7 but are now looking at using trophy instead. The K2 Black Panther features a soft kill system with the K2 PIP variant featuring a hard kill ADS. And then you've got systems like Iron Fist for deployment on lighter vehicles like Bradley's. This is already taken over as the norm for fighting vehicles of today. In almost 10 years time, the lack of any APS and especially a laser warning receiver on Challenger 3 will be seen as regressive at best. At worst, bad joke. Now there are plans reportedly to equip Challenger 3 with an active defence system before it reaches combat service, but that so far has not been finalised. Whatever option that will be, whether that's trophy or any hard kill system, or even a simple soft kill APS and laser warning receiver, is still yet to be decided. And that is a worrying factor. Challenger 3s may hit the battalions in 2027 not yet equipped with such protection, and if that is the case, and this tank is not going to stack up well against its contemporaries, really in any regard by that time. This is one of the main takeaways I have from Challenger 3. This is a tank being touted as a brand new tank, of course the name Challenger 3 rather than Challenger 2 LEP or Challenger 2 Mark II suggests this being a new vehicle. But it really isn't, this is an upgrade for Challenger 2 and that's how most if not all of them are going to be built, they will be rebuilt CR2s not brand new tanks. What I'm seeing is that this really is an incremental improvement over Challenger 2, rather than an evolutionary one which we saw between the Cold War era Challenger 1 to the Challenger 2 in the 90s, or a revolutionary upgrade the kind we see between say the Leopard 1 and 2. Yes, it upgrades the gun to the best NATO has to offer right now. Yes, it includes new internal systems, and very good ones at that. And yes, it does bring a laundry list of other upgrades, such as an independent latest generation thermal viewer for the Commander, for the Challenger 2 to lack that functionality in the late 90s through the 2000s, and even to this day, it never got added to serial production tanks, uh, is just very poor, in fact, somewhat of a joke. But Challenger 3 still sits up there as the heaviest of main battle tanks around, without upgrading to a 1500 horsepower or higher engine, at least not at this point. Still uses a four-man crew, including a manual loader, and still features the same armour layout, including the same large weak spot in the driver's viewport, given the hull's somewhat poor design that doesn't allow this weak spot to be closed up. So all in all, I feel like the so-called Challenger 3 is only really being called that because it's arrived about 15 years too late to be referred to as Challenger 2 Mark II, and had it been produced 10 to 15 years ago, it would have been seen as an absolutely fantastic tank right up there with the best in the world. But given that this vehicle is only to enter full combat readiness conditions in 2030, I kinda help but feel that this upgrade didn't go far enough. I can't really put it any other way. The move to the L55A1 smoothbore is certainly a good step, but with huge amounts of research and resources being put into development of larger 130 or even 140mm guns for the Abrams, Leopard 2, Leclerc, etc, all of which being paired with autoloaders and these looking like the types of weapon systems that will be present on the future main battle tanks of all these nations. This surely would have been the perfect time for Britain to make a revolutionary step forward and adopt these cutting edge features into the design of their future tank, establishing a trend rather than simply following one. And doing so rather late. This is something I've talked about with both Challenger 1 and Challenger 2 in the past, that Britain designed a great tank for the year in which they designed it, while other nations such as America and Germany were designing their own equivalents for the future, and this, the Challenger 3, seems to be no different. Britain hasn't learned that crucial lesson. Design the tank for tomorrow, not the tank for today. And lo and behold, the Abrams and Leopard 2 are still widely regarded as the top two tanks out there today, both substantially lighter and faster than Challenger, and yet better armoured and protected with 
active defense systems for variants going forward. Only now are those tanks first made in the 70s finally looking at getting full replacements, although last I heard, the Abrams was now going to be formally produced in an M1A3 variant rather than a completely new tank after all. The Challenger, however, only produced several years after those two contemporaries, gave way to the Challenger 2 after less than 20 years, and less than 20 later, we're seeing a Challenger 3, which is only expected to serve into the 2040s, a mere decade after full combat readiness is expected, from a rather low number of less than 150 tanks. Combine that with the £800 million budget being set aside for this machine, meaning a cost of about £5.5 million per unit, over £7.5 million US dollars, and I'm wondering whether this tank was only selected over, say, the Leopard 2, in order to create jobs in Britain. Of course, some 650 jobs will be opened by the creation of Challenger 3. And it is true that, you know, buying foreign equipment creates none and sets Britain way back when it does come to eventually replacing the Challenger platform with a fully new tank entirely as they'd lack that experienced industry. I think it's important to define this as an upgrade to Challenger 2, a variant of it, if you will and not a fully new machine. And the relatively short predicted service life and the fact that it is using the Challenger 2 as a basis and retaining many of its features does support that. This is not a trendsetter and it's not really at the cutting edge of tank development as a whole. It's nothing we haven't seen before, it's just an improvement on what we have seen before. And if it were entering into full combat readiness today instead of in 10 years time, it would have been perfect. But this isn't a new tank, it features the same sorts of upgrades you'd expect from a new variant of an existing tank, which is exactly what the Leopard 2A7 or M1A2C are. Of course, that doesn't make it a poor tank by any means, this will be a fiercely effective battlefield asset, with potentially the best fire control systems, gun and ammunition, battlefield management and computing systems, data linking systems, and off-road handling as well of any tank in the world. In 10 years time, will that still ring true? We are yet to see, possibly not. But in my opinion, this tank is coming out about 10 years too late. And what Britain really needed to repair its reputation as a tier one military power was a fully new tank design that allows them to completely fix the issues of Challenger 2 while also including the new features that a Challenger 2 Mark II should have gotten many years ago. Instead, they're trying to brute force Challenger 2 into being a competitive 2030s main battle tank. And I don't think they've gone far enough. Anyway guys, that is my kind of assessment of the Challenger 3, a tank that I am very excited to see, but I just can't help feel that this is a bit of a timid step up, when a leap was more what we needed. I do hope to see more information regarding this tank in the future, active protection systems, potential engine upgrades, etc, but right now, my hopes for this tank's place on the battlefield of the 2030s could be higher, let's just say that. As far as that age-old question of would it beat this tank, who would win in a fight, that is just so irrelevant. You can't just stack up vehicles like that in contrived scenarios and ignore the million and one other potential variables that will change the outcome. And either way, it's not going to happen, guys, and it certainly isn't influencing the design of these tanks. So making up scenarios where 20 M1A2s fight 20 Leopards is all good fun, but it means nothing and certainly isn't an indicator of superiority. Now, once again, this is just my opinions given what I know of tank design and warfare and what I see in the Challenger 3. Perhaps you value my opinion, perhaps you don't, either way. If yours are different or if you agree with my assessment, then please let's hold some civilized discussion down in the comments. I bet I've rustled some feathers with what I've said here today, but that really was not my intention. I've been heavily requested to talk about my thoughts on this new tank, and I wanted to share that with you guys. And I'd love to know what your own thoughts are on what I've said here and about Challenger 3 in general. Make sure to support our channel on Patreon. It really, really does make a hell of a difference. And until next time, thank you for listening to me ramble on about this tank today. Stay safe, and I'll catch you all on the battlefield. Now, the missiles of the MiG-25 are quite good. The R-40, like many Russian missiles, including the ones on the new MiG-23, have both an infrared and a semi-active radar homing version, and what I would suggest is that you'd carry two of each. 
You also have the ability to carry R23s, the MiG-23M's missiles, which could be good stock missiles for the MiG-25, and R60s if you did something stupid like wake up happy this morning and want to use the MiG-25 in close quarters to fix that. 